Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a new year-round digital talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and theater. And today we are joined by Julian Wass, who is a co-producer, writer, producer and director on Room 104 on HBO, which is currently in its final season right now. Um, how, I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about how your job has started to look like it's really shifting and changing during quarantine, uh, because obviously everything's been completely remote. I don't know if you were working on any projects when we went into the shutdown that have been continuing in that way, or if it's more just that you're having conversations already about what productions are going to look like for you moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know a few composers who were lucky enough to be on jobs that like uh finish shooting before the lockdown started so they were able to work that was not the case with me the last thing i was composing on was actually season four of room 104 which we finished uh i think in november so um you know as you mentioned i've been transitioning and doing more writing uh so that's been something i've been working on uh during quarantine because i i can and i have time to be doing that but um yeah i mean really just looking forward to when we can have sets again and you know some of the stuff i'm writing can be uh hopefully produced yeah one of the things i think is so fascinating about your work as a composer is the need and ability to be able to step into so many different types of stories and so many different genres and way of communicating a narrative arc through the sound of what it's going to look like across film and television uh, which even in mediums are very different. And was that something that you began to think about very early on in needing to be very nimble and be able to pivot what your personal style was going to be into these different spaces? Yeah, I mean, it was probably um, just a kind of like a requirement, you know, because when I got started, I got started really working with Duplass Brothers. Um, and, you know, their, I mean, especially their, their earlier work was, you know, sort of famous for being like micro budget. So obviously I was working on kind of a micro budget thing as well. And so what I found myself doing is just using whatever I had, um, you know, instrument wise, or I, you know, I play a lot of instruments. So I get kind of creative with what I use digitally and try to make it sound real. Um, but yeah, I mean, just with that, with working with them, there are so many different kinds of movies that we worked on early on that I did kind of have to shift my style. I mean, something like The Freebie, which was like, I think one of the first movies I scored, which was like a sensitive, uh, you know, kind of emotional relationship drama. So, you know, versus like Dodecapentathlon, which I think I did right either before or after that. And that was like this like big kind of like, supposed to be almost like Rudy or like inspirational sports. So that was pretty early on. I was like, okay, I'm going to have to kind of like adapt and do whatever the job needs. And that's definitely been my, um, that's largely been my sort of manifesto through my composing career. Yeah. And you and Mark had known each other for such a long time when you started doing all of this work on Room 104 and, yes. and you stepped into writing your first episode. I think it was in the second season, the episode Arnold, which is one of my favorites. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, did that kind of just really make you feel more confident and comfortable stepping into a completely new realm and a new space? Because the writing of the episode itself actually came off the back of you composing the, the music for it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the writing of it came off the fact that, um, you know, Mark had said he wanted to do a musical episode. And after we started brainstorming the ideas for what like a Room 104 musical could be, like we we're just like really just trying to get out, like think about, um, you know, what would, you know, how could we do a musical in the room? And from those talks, like we just started coming with ideas and, and you know, we started writing the episode together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was just a function of like really, I think wanting the music to be like baked in and not just be sort of like some other story idea we had that we sort of like added songs to. We really wanted it to like, from the jump be like that the music was part of part of it the whole time. So really the first outline we wrote was like really not a lot of dialogue and it would just sort of like be these like, descriptions of what's happening until we get to one of the songs because we wrote the songs pretty early so we knew that like okay these four songs will sort of like be these anchor points so yeah like the music actually kind of i wouldn't say came first but the music was really um important um, yeah, what came really the, early what point in the process did you know that it was going to be brian tyree henry to really kind of know what his voice and his style as a performer was going to be with that well that's funny because like mark is so good about this stuff that he when we started writing it, he immediately was like, I think Brian Tyree Henry would be really good for this. And I was sort of like, wow, you think he would do it? And I think sometimes like, you know, Mark is out there and he meets people and he gets a sense that they would be down to work with him. So he kind of keeps that in his back pocket. So he didn't get my hopes up and say like, Brian's definitely going to do it. But from the jump, he was like, Brian is, I think would be the right person for this. And I totally agreed. And I was like, I just hope he says yes, because we wrote it for him. And we were so lucky that he said yes, because he's like such an immense talent. He's incredible. 
Yeah, and it seems like such a natural fit that after writing the music and, and working with Mark on the script that you ended up directing it, but that was actually your first time ever stepping behind the camera in that realm. What was it, was it about doing it that kind of, you know, I know that you had some initial hesitations. What was it about the whole process that suddenly made you feel really safe stepping into that role and, and being like, yes, actually, this is something I really want to do? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, like, I've mentioned this before that, like, as an artist, I'm, I'm insecure, or, you know, have a lot of self doubt, like many artists do. And that's something I, I, you know, I struggle with and try to get past and just, you know, focus on the work. And I found that, like, this was a really good experience to just focus on the work, because, like, there wasn't a lot of time to be doubtful, because once we started working on pre production, it was just, I found that, like, yeah, the collaborators and the crew is like, what made it so awesome, because, you know, it wasn't like, everybody was coming to me with like, this is our idea for the costumes. I'm like, that's awesome. Or like, let's change it a little bit. And I felt really, I felt so supported by everybody um, that like they were there to really help me do this, you know? And then, um, like I said, on the first day on set when we were doing rehearsals, I, I really realized I'm like, oh, like I'm like in this room, I'm like dancing, I'm singing the songs, I'm trying to show everybody what the blocking is going to be. And like, God, if someone else was doing this, it would be so much more complicated. We wouldn't have time. I mean, it'd be possible for me to like be there as the composer, maybe help the director. But in the time frame we had, like, I don't think someone else could have done it because like, we're constantly, we're like, essentially we're recording the songs live on set. So like, I sort of had to be on top of like, not just performance, but also like, is the song working the way we wanted it to? So I felt pretty, I actually gained a lot of confidence really quickly being like, oh, I don't think this would have been possible if I didn't direct it. So I, I, I did a pretty big shift from being like, I don't think I can direct this. Or I'm really frightened to because I because I haven't done it before to being like, oh, no, this is like this was the right decision. You know, I'm the right person for this. And I mean, I have to thank Mark for like putting me in a position to succeed there, you know. Yeah, no, it's so fantastic. And, you know, from from what you're saying, it sounds like there really was just this safety net where the team around you were never going to let it be a failure in, in itself to begin with. And were there ways in which you like really leaned on the other producers and the other showrunners and maybe even just looking to some of the other directors that had come into the show at that point that you'd worked with as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, like, uh, at that point, my, my wife, Janae Lamarck, who's a director and uh, has made a couple movies and directed a lot of TV, the, at that point she had already directed a Room 104 episode. So I definitely like leaned on her a lot. And I had, you know, been on set for the episode that she directed, partially because we co-wrote it together, but also like as a way to sort of get a sense of how the, the set would, would work. But, you know, I have to credit um, Sean McElwee, who was the DP that shot Arnold, because he, you know, just was so helpful with, um, you know, just planning the shots. And I felt really supported by him. I felt like, I know that like, he's really focusing on a lot of technical stuff. And so that I can, I don't have to worry about that. I mean, I'm, he's there to talk with me and to sort of like collaborate, but I can really focus on the, the music and the, the dancing and the, and the performances and the stuff that I know was like more my, my strong suit coming into Arnold. Yeah, being involved in, as a director as well. And, you know, since then as a, as a producer on the show, has it made you kind of appreciate and understand some of the systems that are going on around you when you're on a project as a composer and think about anything in the way that you do it, just really knowing, okay, that person's job is to do this, this needs to happen this way, and this is how it impacts me differently. To oh, I, before. Yeah, absolutely. Because like as a composer, like I've had this experience through most of my career where by the time I'm uh, working, you know, most people aren't even working on the show anymore. You know, um, they, it, it's, it's like, it's obviously it's been, pre-produced, it's been written, shot, acted, largely edited. I mean, I'll have interaction with the editor and the producers and the director at that point, but it's so, it's so far along that um, I generally, I don't, I don't get to know the people on set unless there's like a pre-record, like a piece of music that I have to write and come supervise. And that happened on Room 104 quite a bit, but it hadn't really happened in my career. So just like being involved with Room 104 has really showed me what, what it's like on set. And it's also sort of, uh, I've mentioned this before in interviews, but I think this is so funny. This was such an interesting experience that like, you know, a lot of times by the time I'm getting it as a composer, it's really clear that like maybe some things worked better than they thought and some things worked not as well. And obviously like as a composer, I'm sort of like, you can be the sort of the last line of defense, sort of like to make a scene work if it's not working the way that they envisioned. And um, so that's something I'm really familiar with. What I wasn't familiar with was writing something and then later as the composer realizing that my writing wasn't very good and I need to fix it as a composer. And that was kind of a really like strange experience, but it, you know, it made me sort of have like a lot of compassion and love for the whole process, which is that like 
somebody writes something has to go through so many hands and so many iterations and all these people need to work on and everyone's doing their best. And even then sometimes like it just doesn't, it doesn't click the way you thought, or maybe it clicks even better and maybe you don't need music, but that was a really odd experience to sort of like score something that I had written and sort of wonder like, Oh, well, if I'd written it, if I just written it this way, I actually wouldn't have to score it this way, you know? Yeah. I was also wondering about the process and the way that you work with directors on a show like Room 104 versus, you know, when you're working on something like Fresh Off the Boat, which is, you know, a, probably a little bit more show showrunner heavy versus director heavy, because the way that they bring directors in on this show is very different. So I was interested if it was yeah. a more involved and collaborative process that you have with them. I mean, I do think that, you know, at the end, I mean, Room 104 is still at the end of the day, I think like a lot of the final decisions come down to Mark Duplass and Sidney Fleischman. But, um, you know, I know that like Room 104, unlike, yeah, some other shows, like really does try to loop their directors in. So, I mean, maybe the directors won't have like final say, but I know that like every time I've composed on an episode, I usually get some notes from the director and that always feels nice to be able to connect with them and collaborate with them. So I think that's unique to, I mean, maybe not unique to Room 104, but definitely something that makes Room 104 special that those guest directors get to have sort of like a, a pass on the music, you know? Yeah, I also love the sound of the collaborative relationship on the episode where you wrote the music for Michael Shannon, Swipe Right. <laughs> I that she actually had some input on the song and kind of gave you a list of some of the Russian cities that she wanted included. So was that episode and the way that the music came together for that one different to any of the others? Yeah, that one was super different actually because um, number one, uh, yeah, like writing that writing that rap off of Liza's um, you know request for like what cities and phrases she wanted. That was pretty fun. Obviously, I had to like perform a scratch version of it for Michael to learn. So that was like a very odd experience to think about Michael Shannon, like listening to my rap version of that, like however many times he had to listen to it to learn it. That was super weird to think about. Um, and then, you know, that episode didn't actually have any other score, but um, I don't know if you remember that episode has like this brass band that keeps kind of like barging into the room. So we actually like that band didn't play live on set, but later on we sort of like uh, you know, dubbed it with like a real brass band. And so the, all the score for the episode, including like the theme song in the beginning was all done by that, by that kind of Russian style brass band. So that, that process is actually a really different, um, really different than the normal Room 104 scoring. Cause we usually don't really bring, it'd be just like I play on almost every other episode. I think I played everything, all the instruments myself. So it's probably one of the only times we brought in any musicians on Room 104. Yeah. And you were mentioning your wife briefly earlier, who you've co-written episodes on the show with, and, and that mm -hmm. also was the first time that the two of you wrote together. What yeah. prompted that collaborative relationship between the two of you on the show? Uh, well, I mean, we had like talked about writing something together um, for a while, um, which like obviously I hadn't really had the opportunity to do that. But, but Room 104 seemed like a really interesting thing to try to write for because she was really excited to get into TV and she knew that like I, after the first season, I feel like I knew the form pretty well. So I think like we basically just went on like a three hour hike and started talking about like what kind of episode we might want to write together. And by the end of the hike, we actually had a pretty solid, we pretty much had the episode plotted out and we pitched it and Mark and Sid went for it. And so we got an opportunity to write it. So it was really, really cool. But I think it was largely a function of like her really wanting to do that and being really ready to write that episode. And I think me being able to be helpful by having been really um, intimately involved with like what the form of a Room 104 was. So I think I was in a good position to sort of like be able to pitch that episode as like in sort of context of the first season, like sort of making it like similar to episodes in the first season, but different, you know, sort of like that kind of mold, you know what I mean? Yeah, and obviously, you know, at this point, having written specifically for the show and really knowing that world as you're putting a script together, um, has it kind of sparked an interest in writing scripts beyond this now that it's coming to an end? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something I'd really like to pursue. I mean, it's 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 sad because like I feel like I did get pretty good in, at writing Room 104s and there's really nothing quite like that. We're just this like blank canvas to write something that takes place in one room. But um, it's definitely like taught me a lot about um, just being economical, you know, in terms of like, ooh, like I've, I've learned how to tell some stories just in this one room. So now it feels sort of exciting to have like more than one location when I'm writing something, you know, that's kind of like, feels like this big luxury. So hopefully I can keep my writing, um, uh, I don't wanna say economical, but I do feel like it's fun to try to like think of stuff, especially now in this, I don't even know what sets are gonna be like when they go back, but I do think that like the less people you can have, probably the sooner you could get it produced would be my guess, just because 
So, so that does kind of feel like a carryover from room 104, like trying to find stories to tell that maybe they don't have to just be in one room, but maybe they could be between not that many people and explore that, you know? Yeah, I feel like working with the Duplass brothers is the perfect boot camp for learning how to write something on a budget and execute a really great vision. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's really that. I mean, that's that's their whole jam, and it's really fun to be a part of it. Yeah, are there ways in which your process in writing has evolved and shifted and changed throughout the time that you've been doing it on the show? Just in terms of the space that you create for yourself, when you work in the day, how you kind of structure out the narrative. I mean, I do feel like with as 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 a composer, I have a like I've been doing it long enough that I do have all these sort of like methods that I like to do, and I definitely feel like. Writing for Room 104 was a little bit of that like beginner mind mentality where I sort of like didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I had the opportunity to sort of like do it in just whatever way works. So um, I did a lot of writing for season four, for some of the episodes I wrote for season four of Room 104, I did a lot of writing at the public library, actually. I found that um, just going to like any public library and finding a corner and like I would put on like some kind of like ambient or new age music or something like just sort of like you know, synthesizer, you know, music. And uh, and I would just go, you know, and I would maybe like try not to stay too long, maybe just do like a two hour session at the most, and then maybe go get lunch, maybe come back and do another hour. Um, that was pretty cool. I mean, again, like getting out of my composing space, cause I have like a space at my house where I do my composing. And I did find that like writing there was really challenging because I really associated with like a different kind of work. So I found that changing my location uh, physically was super helpful. For yeah. writing. And in mentioning that you, you know you have kind of those processes really baked in for yourself as a composer, what are some of the setups that you create for yourself in that realm? Well, uh, one thing I've learned as a composer is like I need to be really patient with myself because I, I, I used to be really hard on myself because like I would get a job, I would spot the movie with the director or the producers or both, and I would get home and then I would just like not want to work on it. I would sort of like feel like, oh no, I don't want to work on this. But what it actually was was I would like think about the job like for two weeks and feel like oh no I'm not getting anything done but then after like you know maybe 10 days two weeks I would sit down and just like write a bunch of music and so I had to sort of feel like maybe that's like part of the process like rather than that being like a, I used to think oh that's like a procrastination or that's like a fault of mine that like I can't work on it right away I actually like come to accept and feel confidence that like okay like maybe part of it is that you just have to think about stuff for a while and that's work too I guess like it didn't feel like work at first, but I've come to accept that like that thinking time is work. And that's what makes it so that after that thinking time is over, I can actually like execute what I've been thinking about. And maybe like those ideas wouldn't have quite percolated. So being more accepting of that has been a really good thing for, I guess all my work, but especially for composing. Yeah. And particularly, you know, with, with a show like this and the fact that every single episode has a completely different voice to it in terms of the narrative story that it's telling, even just genre wise within the overall setting, kind of how do you begin that process of just sitting there and almost letting it speak to you and tell you what its voice is going to be and thinking about the different style that you want to go in musically? Well, I usually think of like for Room 104, I usually think I usually would think of like some kind of high concept thing. So if it was like like, for example, one episode that had a really super conceptual score is uh, the season two episode, Nightmare, with uh, Natalie Morales, um, which was like this bad dream, and it was, it was a lot of horror tropes, you know? So she was like in a dream, in a dream, and kept sort of waking up. And so I guess sort of like thought about like, what would be like a really, what would be something new that we could add to the, so it's not just the same like Room 104 sound. So what I ended up doing is like, I, I, I took like a recording of my guitar feedback, and I loaded it into a sampler, and I kind of created like, this instrument out of it. And so that was cool because that sort of became like the backbone of the episode. And obviously I peppered in a lot of other Room 104 tropes, but that felt like an interesting concept. And I feel like there's been a lot of other episodes where, yeah, like there's always like a bass coat. There's always like the sort of synths and like kind of lo-fi stuff that I use for Room 104. But then every, I try to add something like a special seasoning to every episode that feels like maybe appropriate for it uh especially if it's like a you know episode that's like a period piece just maybe especially like i'm thinking of the the plot which was the season three opener and that one actually sounds a lot more like almost like film noir or something like that so that felt again felt appropriate for that but it always has some of that room 104 sound but i do like to put the custom seasoning on each one <laughs> Yeah, going into this season, especially since you all knew the that this was going to be the final season, was there a different sense of the conversations that you were having and the looseness that you all felt you could approach it with? Just because it's that final moment to get any ideas that you've been percolating on out onto the screen. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we just wanted to go all out. You know, I think we really like, like pretty confident that it was going to be the last season. We just, there was ideas that I know that, um, I mean, I was not part of the first three seasons in that way as a, as a, as a producer, but I knew of some of these ideas that the other producers brought in that had been percolating and, you know, trying to find, figure out if we could like make those work, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, especially like with some of the episodes this season, we just really, we knew we wanted to have another musical. We knew we wanted that to be like really outlandish and really pushing the limits of the room. So, um, and then obviously we have an animated episode this season. So really we just an opportunity to like do all the things we'd always wanted to do with the room. And obviously it's, it's a bummer because there's still stuff that like, there's ideas that we've left behind that we didn't figure out a way to do that we would have loved to find a way to do just because we want to stay in that room forever. But you know, they'll have to live on somewhere else. <laughs> As I say, there, there's always the door open for one-off specials in return. Sure, yeah. Room 104, the movie. Perfect. Well, I, like to call it, I like to call it Rooms 104. Ah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> or like Room 105. <laughs> room, yeah, sure, yeah, the next room. I think the next room is actually Room 106 because 105 would maybe be like across the hall. I don't know. I don't, I, well, I can't, I can't speak to the layout. I don't even want to say anything. I was going to say, you spent a lot of time making a TV show set in a motel. <laughs> mm -hmm. In terms of the way that you all use that physical space, though, it's something that astounds me in every single episode that there's always a new way to use that space and a new journey that you guys take it on. You know, if you look back to the first ever episode, and it really was much more contained. We didn't even see the bathroom yet. Mm -hmm. And in the way it just feels like this much bigger space, you know, especially when you're directing, how do you kind of navigate and think about the different ways that you can really use it to tell these intimate stories? I mean... Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I know that uh, I'm just trying to think about some of the stuff that like I've gotten to do in the room. I mean, definitely like I think lighting is a big thing, you know, for Arnold, like we we really pushed, I think, some of the colors and the lights. And I think that was really fun to make the room look really different. Um, you know, we brought for for the for the one sequence, we brought that giant disco ball and jukebox in and sort of, I don't think that was the first time we made the room represent something else but that's sort of become a trope of like the room representing another space in a memory which has always been fun and like uh, I think the episode that airs this Friday or I don't I don't want to date this particular conversation but uh, it's going to be the third episode of the season called Avalanche with Dave Batista. definitely has some really interesting uses of the room in terms of like what we're always in the room but what the room is like representing and I think that's always been a really fun way to push the limits of the room that like you're still in it but it's maybe representing a memory that happened somewhere else and obviously that was what Arnold was like kind of all about you know represented the bar and the warehouse party and all this other stuff um but yeah I mean I'm always amazed by and I think this just goes out to the um art department and the DPs uh, who work on the show in terms of keeping the look of the room fresh I mean I think you're right that it does really gain a different look from episode to episode and I think that really speaks to like the skill of the crew yeah. more than anything <laughs> I've noticed in a couple of interviews that you all like to be a little bit elusive about where the room is and, and kind of where that setting is. Was that something at the beginning that you all thought it would just be a fun little mystery to create for the audience? I mean, I think we all subscribe to the sort of like, um, in terms of like what information we give, like less is more and that like, it's really like the, the best, the best ideas you'll have about the room will be the ones in your imagination versus whatever we say. So I think it's really more about sort of the open interpretation. Um, kind of leads to more creativity in the minds of the of the viewers rather than us saying like it's here or what it is you know and I've noticed that like people on reddit like to theorize and I think that's great I think that's very healthy yeah it's, it's very David Lynchy in the number of I, that there are out there right now I love it I think that's great I, I support that yeah I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit more about the general process of when you're working with directors and really just kind of the ways in which they can be beneficial to you as a composer because obviously they've they've never done your job and they may not know some of the things that are going into your creative process and what you're doing and how you're working to ultimately serve their vision so what are some of those things with directors that you've really loved working with that they do within the process that really benefit and really help you as you're crafting that music and helping them find the voice yeah, I mean, you know, I know some uh, some composers, I mean, so, some composers really don't like temp music, um, which is, you know, when, you know, directors and editors and producers, you know, sort of put in music from other movies uh, when they're editing. Um, I'm actually a fan of it, honestly. I mean, I think like the downside of temp music is that like sometimes people get so attached to what the temp is doing that it kind of, can, it can like, um, 
it can sort of like decrease the creativity and make it harder to create something. But I feel like a lot of times it's, it, I like to think of temp music as just like a starting off point because I, I know some composers love to work from the blank slate, but I think that like the temp music is a really great opportunity for the director to at least like make some decisions about what the sound of the movie is going to be because like we don't, it's not, you know, it's not the old days anymore. Like movie scores aren't all just like big string sections, you know, movie scores can sound like rock music or electronic music or down. I mean, there's like so many ways that they can sound. Um, and I think it's a bit, I mean, I would always, I would feel a bit presumptive as a composer to sort of like make that decision for the director. I mean, I could, I'm always happy to pitch something that feels appropriate, but I feel like it, you know, just knowing that the the time frame for when I come on as a composer is usually like, there's not maybe as much time, you know, I think it's probably good that, uh, that, that the director has made some kind of gesture to like what they want. And like one example I can think of is uh, when I worked on the uh, Desiree Akhavan's movie, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, um, you know, she had tempted in uh, the band Boards of Canada a lot. And that's like one of my favorite bands. They made one of my favorite albums ever. And so that was like a really good touchstone to be like, okay, like this isn't gonna be a traditional score. This is gonna be kind of like a rough hewn VHS filter wobbly electronic score. And I mean, that's that's something I'm super interested in making, but wouldn't necessarily pitch as an idea. So I was very grateful that she brought that to the table because that was something I, was, I thought worked really well for the movie and something obviously that she wanted. And I think it, that was really important because at the end of the day, it's like what she, you know, what the director wants. So anything that I guess to answer your, I've been very long winded in this, but to answer your question, anything that the director can do that helps like indicate what they want in a con concrete way from the beginning is helpful because music is really hard to talk about and you can talk about it for like I mean I've been on projects where I've talked about the music before they've shot it and we talk and we talk and we talk and then they shoot it and then they edit it and then it gets to me and like everything we've talked about like no longer works you know um so I do think that the temp music is really helpful because if it's working it's working and we can at least like build off that you know so that's how I feel about that <laughs> Yeah, I was also wondering about how your role intersects with the music supervisor when you're working, you know, on a film, because you both have a very clear delineation of what your responsibilities are, but I imagine that there's mm -hmm. a lot of crossover and intersection. So what are those moments where those two roles kind of cross over and come together as you're figuring out, okay, is this going to be a composed piece of music or is this going to be a piece of music that already exists in the ether? Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting. It's always like, I think it's always a back and forth. And when I go to the spotting sessions the music supervisors there and like, I'm super down to collaborate with them. I mean, I feel like there's just a lot of nuts and bolts stuff. I mean, sometimes like there'll be a scene where uh, they want to use like source music and it just becomes a budget issue. So it gets kicked to me to maybe create something that's like a similar vibe that, you know, cause they, they don't necessarily have the money to spend on a song for this scene. And then sometimes like I've kicked stuff back or, or not kicked stuff back to the music supervisor, but basically said that like, you know, I feel like this scene could be, for example, I've been like, this scene could be score, but I think would benefit from the energy of a song. And I do feel like there's just this inherent energy difference between songs and scores, um, which is really interesting to think about because I mean, obviously you can make score sound like a song, but it'll never be a song if that makes sense. You know, like a song that exists outside of a movie and has its own life always brings this like different energy into a scene. So I've sometimes like brought that up being like, look, I can create something that might be similar or might have a similar vibe, but I do think that like the energy that this scene needs really would benefit from like a real song. And I, I've spoken up and you know, that's always been uh, something that I'm comfortable to say to be like, I, I don't agree that this should be score. I think it should be a song, you know? And um, sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't but i think that's that to me is like the most but generally it's a very collaborative relationship and we're definitely looking to help each other in a sense like if they can find you know if, if it's maybe something that's really background like what if it's like i don't know like for example like hold the music on on a telephone you know if someone's on uh, in the scene is on hold and there's like muzak playing that's obviously something i could make but it's also something that's really easy to get from like a library some of the music supervisor will sort of give me an assist and maybe take something off my plate so that I can focus on maybe some of the more important dramatic scenes um, and vice versa. Like if they're running short on money and it, you know, budget wise, and they need me to help out and kind of like kick in a, a fake song, I'm always happy to do that. So largely it's just a very fun collaborative thing, just looking out for each other and trying to actually help each other. That's so great. And then in terms yeah. of, kind of your overall craft and, and process, are there things that you do for yourself, particularly as a musician to continue evolving 
uh, your abilities and your craft, whether it's kind of just new discovery of different genres, different music that maybe you haven't listened to before, continuing to look at and learn new instruments. Like what is it that you do to continue educating yourself and continue learning throughout this process? Yeah, I mean, definitely like listening to music uh, and just discovering new music is a huge one. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, honestly, like YouTube, I just, I love YouTube for this, not just because YouTube is a great way to discover music, but um, there's also just a lot of really good uh, music education on YouTube. So, I mean, I have a music degree. I was probably like one of the worst students uh, in my music, graduating music class. Uh, I probably was the worst, honestly. I'm not even going to lie and pretend like I was like one of the worst. I was for sure the worst. I was like really behind when I started the music program. Uh, I was just really like struggled to kind of like become a good music theory person. So, you know, I've wanted to like right that wrong. And the best way I found to do that is like these YouTube videos where someone sort of like dissects a song and talks about like what's going on musically and harmonically. And that's been very fun and educational. Um, and that's helped my music because like, I, I'm really like an ear person. So I just play stuff and see what sounds good. But I've tried to increase my ability to at least like understand more of what's going on and why something works. And that's been, that's been helpful. But I would say, yeah, like my, you know, continuing, I, I can't call it really, it's not necessarily education, but at least learning new things from, from some of these YouTube music people. And then, yeah, just continuously like listening to, I listen to music whenever I'm not making music basically. And just trying to experience new music. It sounds like you never sleep <laughs> based on all these things. Well, I also have music playing in my head all the time, which I thought everyone had, but I've discovered that that's not true. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I hear it sometimes, but it's not throughout the day continuously. It's, I think that's why I like to put it on because then it stops in my head, you know, and I can just focus on what's playing, so. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing such incredible insight, not just on oh. the so the way that you put all of this amazing stuff together it's been such a pleasure oh thank you this has been really fun uh, thank you for for talking